which is the ability to measure reason, logic, deduction, analytical abilities. And um, we used to think that IQ determined success. Isaac Watts once made the statement that the mind is the measure of a man. But then, new studies came out, and they said that emotional quotient, EQ, which is one's ability to manage your emotions, your moods, your feelings, and to keep them under control. They considered that as the major contributing factor to success even above IQ. And Solomon in the book of Proverbs makes the statement that he who controls himself is better than he who captures a city. But then they realized that IQ, EQ, were valuable factors, valuable ingredients, but there was something more that determined success in life. In 1997, Dr. Paul Stoltz introduced a new scientific study. After studying for about 25 years and testing thousands and thousands of people, he came up with adversity quotient. And it tells how well one can withstand pressure. How you can withstand adversity, setbacks, and how you have the ability to triumph. It measures, it measures your ability to bounce back. And now social scientists are saying that AQ adversity quotient is a more valid indicator to a person's success in life over IQ or EQ. Now, AQ is rooted in three sciences, and it's important for you to understand the background, because there's really nothing new. But what Dr. Stoltz has done is gather the material and funnel it into an area. And he's taken material from three basic sciences. The first is psychoneuroimmunology. That was first made popular by Dr. Norman Cousins. You remember, he had alkalosis spondylitis, and he was given up uh, as incurable. And he started watching the Marx Brothers films, and he started laughing, and he started taking large doses of intravenous vitamin C. And he just started thinking positive, thinking optimistic, and he reversed his illness. Psychoneuroimmunology. How the mind impacts your health. Alan White talks about that in Ministry of Healing in the chapter Mind Cure, and she says that the mind and the body have a very intimate and sympathetic relationship. The second field of study that Dr. Stoltz draws from is neurophysiology. How the mind, the central nervous system, work. The different chemistries, the electrical impulses, and that, to me, is vital. Simply because Ellen White makes the statement in the testimony, she says, that the Holy Spirit works, the only medium that the Holy Spirit works in and through is the central nervous system. So whatever affects the central nervous system affects the relationship that the Holy Spirit has with you. And 
the neurophysiology is, is extremely important to understand and to work with. And the third science is cognitive restructuring. How to formulate thoughts so that you can control your moods and emotions. And we talked about that two weeks ago. Dr. Stokes defines AQ as the capacity of a person to deal with the adversities of life. As such, he calls it the science of human resilience. Not just dealing with stress, not just dealing with adverse situations, not just dealing with setbacks, deprivation, illness, loss of a job, loss of income, but thriving, thriving under those circumstances. That's resilience. Now, he has uh, comprised a test, and in this test, he measures different things, stress thresholds, capacity for change, perseverance, and it basically, this test that he has, you can get it uh, on the internet, and, or you can buy his book, or, or whatever. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just trying to bring a point out that the test is available. It's interesting, but it measures four things, four things, and it's called CORE, C-O-R-E, and it's an acronym. CORE. C stands for control. How much control do you think you have over the adverse situation? Do you think that you could get in there, turn it around, and make a difference? Or do you think that the situation is permanent? Hopeless, helpless. And if you do, then you have the mindset of a victim. And you won't do anything about it because you've given up already in an adverse situation. So the first is control. How much control do you think you have? How much control in a situation? Second is ownership. What's your responsibility in an adverse situation? How much do you own of it? How much is it someone else's responsibility? And where do you draw the line? Because the more ownership we have, the more responsible we become, and the more accountable we are. Now, I want you to note, this is interesting, because you can disengage, and you can shut off, and you can say, that's his problem. And then you cut off. But Christ had to deal with this situation with the Pharisees. You remember when they asked him, who is my brother? And the Jews asked him. And Christ told them the story of the good Samaritan, which the Jews hated. And what Christ was trying to teach is, we are all one. <coughs> we are all brothers and sisters. And what affects one affects all, ultimately, ultimately. And then the R stands for reach. How far does the adverse situation or circumstance have a ripple effect and go into other areas of my life? Is it localized? Or is it pervasive? Does it go into other areas? Does it permeate my whole life? Every aspect of my life. The fourth is endurance. 
how long will the adverse situation last? Is it going to last for the rest of my life? Or am I going to outlast it? And so these are the four areas that are tested in this profile. And then he divides it into optimists and pessimists. He says a pessimist is someone who considers an adversity as something permanent. Permanent. I'm stuck with it for the rest of my life. It's all pervasive and it's deeply personal. They believe that a crisis will never end and that it ultimately will destroy everything in their life. And they believe it's their fault. It's their fault. They contributed to this. An optimist is one who sees adversity and problems as challenges to intervene and change. They see it as stepping stones. They see problems as temporary. They're limited and they're external to themselves. They don't internalize the issue because they have a certain amount of self love and self assurance because of their background. And they have a philosophy this too shall pass away. I'm going to outlast this. It's going to pass. And so you have. The pessimist and the optimist, and then he lists about 22 recommendations how to strengthen and improve your adversity quotient. I've read a lot of these books, and they have a lot of good things, a lot of things that are beneficial. And I've dabbled a little bit in some of these things. Uh, I wrote with Dr. Stuart Atkins a book on temperament, stress, and temperament um, uh, assessments. We did surveys. I went to industries, went to churches, went to different ministerial groups, and did a lot of these things. And they're interesting. They're very interesting. But. There's something about all of this stuff that's lacking. And I could never, I, I could never really put my whole heart into it. Because it seemed like the, the a lot of the psychological self-help things left God out of the picture. Now, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good, but uh, there's, um, the, there's the missing of the God factor. In your bulletin, if you take a look, you'll notice a quotation. It's a quotation found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 146. Here, inspiration gives us a tremendous insight. Tremendous insight. She says, it is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do, and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. He longs to have you reach after him by faith. He longs to have you expect great things from him. He longs to give you understanding in temporal as well as spiritual matters. He can sharpen the intellect and he can give tact and skill. <coughs> she 
she goes on, she says, never allow yourself to talk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do, you'll lose much. Notice. By looking at appearances <laughs> and complaining when difficulties and pressures come, you give evidence of a sickly and feeble faith. Now, I want you to notice what she says next. Because there's some real science in this next sentence. <coughs> she says, talk and act as if your faith were invincible. Yeah. Did you get that? Now, when you stop and think about change, how to change, how to be transformed, how to be converted, there are two ways, or two avenues. One, inside out. You're not going to do it, you may fall apart. Inside out, okay? The Holy Spirit comes in you. He starts giving you thoughts, giving you new impulses, new desires. And you start leading towards those new desires, new impulses, those convictions. And you follow them. But there's a second way. Not only inside out, but outside in. You may not feel like something, but God says, talk and act as if, as if your faith were invincible. That's why obedience is so important when it comes to sanctification. You don't feel like it, but you do it anyway. You go through the motions. And then, after you do that, the feelings change. After the actions are there. Then she goes on and she says, the Lord is rich in resources. He owns the world. And don't forget that. Now, when you look at all of these things dealing with adversity, there are certain things you need to know. Number one, you need to know who you are. And you need to know why you are. You were created in the image, in the likeness of the old man. You were created like God. You were created by God. And God, in Genesis 1, verse 26, 28, gave dominion of everything to you. God gave you dominion. He gave you dominion. He created you for a purpose. And it wasn't for you to enjoy the pleasure his world, his life for a season. God created you as a unique and a distinct creation to vindicate his character before the universe. That's before the millennium. And that's the only thing that God needs you for. God needs you. He needs you for that. He doesn't need you for anything else. But he needs you to vindicate his character before the universe in the midst of the great controversy. That's before the millennium. After the millennium, God created you to replace the one-third of the four angels that left heaven. You will replace them, and you will be ambassadors, kings and priests to the universe throughout eternity. That's 
your destiny. That's your destiny. You're going to rule and reign for eternity. Now, the devil doesn't like that. Do you think, do you think that the devil wants you to succeed? Huh? Do you think that the devil is going to make it easy for you? Do you think that he is going to give you a smooth, easy metaphrosis? No. He is furious. He is angry. He is like a roaring lion. But when Christ died for us, he redeemed us. And when he redeemed us, he adopted us and he reinstated us. He reinstated us as sons and daughters of God. And he told his disciples, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All authority. And I am with you always. I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. He is with us in all time and in all space. But then he told his disciples in John 14, 16 and 7, that he was going to give the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit would be with us and in, in us. That's two different kinds of relationships. With us and in us. And when he comes in us, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, we need to take care of the housing structure. We need to be careful about the things that we do and our health, our rest, our sleep. And we need to learn how to manage some of the stressors of life. Because even holy men can break down and get nervous breakdowns. One of the classic examples is James White, but also Elijah. If you remember Elijah, Elijah was a mighty man of God. Mighty man of God. He went to Mount Carmel. He stayed there all day long in the middle. Uh, uh, of the hot Middle Eastern sun and he confronted 850 priests of Baal and Ashtoreth and heaven came down with fire to confirm and then after that after being out in the hot sun all day long he went down Mount Carmel and with a sword killed 850 priests. Now that takes a lot of energy. And it's bloody and gushing. I remember many times when I would do surgery, just taking the scalpel and making an incision, I'd get squirts. It would come on me. Now Elijah had taken the sword cutting and thrusting. <laughs> and anger. Don't you think he got a little feedback? Blood and guts. Blood and guts. Then, he decides to run from Mount Carmel to the palace of Jezreel, 28 miles. And it's raining. It's muddy. He's slipping and sliding as he's, as he's hoping. He's slipping and sliding, and he's running 28 miles, 28 miles. And then he comes to the palace, he sits there. And he hears the voice of one woman. One woman. Now it's true, she was a powerful woman, and she had command of all the armies. She had influence. And she says, as he has done my prophets, 
so happy to him. And he is overwhelmed. Can you believe the contrast? Just a few hours ago, he was confronting 850 prophets of Baal, and he slew them. And now, a few hours later, he just hears, hears rumors of a threat, and he runs in fear and pain. And what made the difference? His body. He was drained. He was drained physically and emotionally. And if you want to deal with stress and maintain a higher stress tolerance level, you have to take care of your body. You have to take care of your body. Christ told his disciples that he was the vine and they were the branches. And if they wanted to produce, if they wanted to have life, they had to abide in him and make the connection, because without him, they could do nothing. He assured them that if they believed in him, they would do the same kind of works, of works that he did, and even greater works than he did. He said that even if they had just a teeny little bit of faith and acted on it, just a little bit of faith like the seed of mustard seed that they can say to this mountain move and it will move. And the disciples, they turned the world upside down in just that first century because they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they had faith. There's one thing about God's work that I have been convinced over and over and over and over about and that is all God's beings are enablings. If God impresses you to do something, rest assured that God is not calling you to fail. God will provide everything you need to accomplish His purposes. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 8 says that God is able to. Uh, make all grace or power abound towards you that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to do every good work. And in Philippians 4.19 he says, My God shall supply all your need according to the riches of his glory. In Ephesians 3.20 he goes on and he even says, God will give you more than you even ask or think. Think God transcends your requests and needs. He never stops. God never finishes. You can rest assured and have the confidence that what God starts, He will finish. God doesn't give up on us. Philippians 1 6. And in 1 Corinthians 10 13, God isn't going to overload you with any more than you can handle. God only allows on you what he puts in you to endure and to carry on. That means any circumstance that you're in, you can overcome. Because God said he's not going to overload you. And ultimately we know that all things work together for good. We know that all things ultimately work together for good. The Apostle Paul experienced a lot of difficulties, a lot of hardships, a lot of reversals. He was beaten, he was persecuted, he was stoned, he was left for dead. But if you look in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9, and 6, verses 9 through 10, you have his attitude on all of this. He says, we are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We're perplexed yet not in despair. Persecuted, yet not forsaken. Cast down, yet not destroyed. I, as unknown, yet well known. As dying, and behold, we live. As chastened, and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. No wonder 
that invincible faith that the Apostle Paul had made him say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. You know what God calls his people? God calls his people Israel. Isn't that right? Israel. It's mentioned 2,600 times. It's first mentioned when Jacob wrestled with Christ at the group Jacob. And Christ changed his name to Israel. But if you look throughout the Bible, God's people are called the children of Israel. If you look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the promise is given to the overcomer. To the overcomer. To him that overcomer. The 144,000 come from the tribe of Israel. And you say, why is that so important? I'll tell you why it's important. We're living in the last days. We're living in the last days. You think this is going to be a cakewalk? There's financial uncertainty all over the world, in Europe, in the United States. We see tensions in the Middle East. All of these tensions, we see poverty, we, we see all kinds of strife. Now, generally speaking, generally speaking, when there's a problem or a disaster in the future somewhere, anticipation is always greater than realization. Isn't that right? Don't we imagine things out the proportion and getting worse than when it really comes? Let me read you a statement from uh, uh, inspiration found in Great Controversy, page 622. The time of trouble, such as never was, is soon going to be upon us. And we shall need an experience that we do not now possess. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. Great Controversy, page 622. In other words, reality is going to far transcend anticipation. Because of that, beloved, we need to think about being grounded and rooted in the Lord. We need to think about being solid in the scriptures and in our experience. We need to take all the tools we can get from all the sciences we can get. But remember, our strength is in the Lord. It's what God can do for us. And God will take us through. God will take us through the very end. And we will see him face to face Amen. as Israel, as Israel, as overcomers, because Christ will never leave or never bend us. I want that experience. Don't you? I want to be Israel. I want to be an overcomer.